My name is Derek Muhammad, community activist, and this is Black History Redefined. I grew up on the northeast side of Houston, Texas, also known as Homestead, Texas. It was that side of the track where not a lot of resources were poured into that area of the community. It was what's called a sacrifice zip code. Sacrifice zip codes are those zip codes that don't have the type of resources necessary to ensure that the children in that zip code receive a quality education, are able to get jobs as teenagers and things of that nature. So I did not have the ideal childhood. I grew up in an area where there was lots of prostitution, lots of drug dealing, uh, gang banging as they call it. But even as a little child, I was always the type to challenge the bully. Even when I was 10 or 11 years old, if I saw an 18 year old or even a grown man picking on the little child, I'd try to fight the grown man in defense of the little child. And even if it cost me my life, I'll stand for what is right. So as early as I can remember as a child, I always wanted to defend the defenseless and be a voice for the voiceless. And it's an honor to be on that road. In 1993, I remember being at a jack-in-the-box fast food restaurant on the corner of Homestead and Tidwell. And I saw a brother selling the Final Call newspaper, he was a member of the Nation of Islam, being harassed by police officers. And I remember parking my vehicle in the drive through leaving it unattended, hopping out to go over and to help the young man. That was just one of many signs of what I believe turned out to be a calling for me. It was that moment that inspired me to join the Nation of Islam and to become a member of the Nation of Islam. And that was the pivotal moment in my life that I believe that made the biggest difference. Um, I always wanted to fight for the people but it was becoming a member of the Nation of Islam where I learned how to fight for the people. So that was most definitely a pivotal moment, one of many. You know, growing up, I never heard the term activist. We didn't have any friends or family members that would say, hey, I wanna grow up to become an activist. We had examples who were football players, basketball players, even pimps and drug dealers, but I never heard that term. Now when I think of the term, I think of someone who's willing to sacrifice that which is sacred to them to the benefit of the whole of the masses of the people. And once you make a lifestyle of doing that, then you become an activist. They say activism is the rent that you pay for occupying your space on the earth. I believe that everybody is in some way, form or fashion an, acti an activist. The problem is not enough of us are actually active. So I think that it's not just a title. I think it's a role that everybody must play. And so I just began working and serving in the community. And that was a title that people attached to my name. And even when the media started referring to myself as an activist, I had no idea what it meant. But because it wasn't a bad name, I just went with it. So when I hear the term activist, I think of someone who's willing to lay it all on the line for freedom, justice, and equality. And it is an honorable title 
as long as we don't use activism in the dishonorable way. When you ignore the suffering of others, you leave the door open for that same suffering to come into your own home. Most of the phone calls that I receive from people who are victims of injustice, these are phone calls from people who never thought that they find themselves in that position. They've always seen instances of gang violence on television, but they never thought that their son would ever be lying in the casket from senseless gun violence. So anytime I fight for somebody else's children, that thing that I'm fighting to help eradicate, in my mind, it's kind of like I play a, a trick on myself. I pretend that that person's child is my child. And let's just say it was a young girl who was sexually assaulted. Well, when I go and I fight for that young girl's virtue and fight for justice for her, I feel as if though I'm beating back the same thing that affected that child, I'm beating it back away from my own child. I don't know, this is the way it, it, it plays over and over again in my head. So that's the formula that I use. There is no instance of injustice that befalls someone else that I am immune from suffering from myself. So I give the analogy of you know, you come outside your home and you see your neighbor's house is on fire. You look back at your home, well, my house is not on fire. Why should I help my neighbor? All it takes is one strong gust of wind and your neighbor's fire becomes your fire. So it is better to come outside and grab a water hose to help put out your neighbor's fire. And that's the best way to guard from it becoming your own. The ideal future for our people is a future wherein we're able to take advantage of opportunities at a leveled playing field with the rest of the world. I'm not saying a future where we're given favors or a future where we ask someone to do for us that, you know, things that we can do for ourselves but we just want equality of opportunity. A future for us, a bright future for us, is a future wherein we receive justice at the same level as everybody else. That's what the future looks like. Black people aren't really asking for much. Black people are asking for more than anything else just the same opportunities that everyone else has been given without being discriminated based upon the color of our skin. So you ask, what do I see as a bright future for us? A future filled with freedom, justice, and equality. And even more important, I think the brightest future for us is a future where the self-hatred that is so pervasive in our community is no longer present and we treat one another according to the golden rule that says do unto your brother as you would have others to do unto you. If I could have a conversation with my 13 year old self the thing that I would instill in that young man more than anything is the expectation to live. Because at 11, 12, 13 years old, growing up in the hood, you've already started losing friends. And when you start losing 13, 14 year old friends and you're 13, 14, 15 years old yourself, there is this subconscious expectation that you won't make it to see 20 or 21. So you always watching the clock to see when your day is gonna come. 
and you don't plan for the future because you believed it's in your mind, it's in your head, it's in your heart that you're not going to even make it that far. So we would ask ourselves the question when looking in the mirror, man, what if I die by the age of 21? But we never ask the question, what if you live? <laughs> what if you make it to 40, 45, 50? So if I thought that I was gonna live this long as a young black male, I would have made better preparations for my life. So that would be the first thing that I say to myself is, you know, expect to live and make preparations to be around for some time because you ain't going nowhere no time soon. I have many silent mentors in history, but the man who has been most pivotal in my life is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad was born in Sandersville, Georgia. He was an unlearned and an unlettered man. He had a third grade education. He went to school just long enough to learn to be able to read. But through a teaching that he learned from his teacher, he produced men like Malcolm X. He produced men like Muhammad Ali. He produced men like Minister Louis Farrakhan and thousands of other great men all produced from the work of this one man. So too often we like to give praise to the fruit, but we don't want to show respect to the tree that produced the fruit. So if I, if I ever had a, a mentor from the past, I don't know if I would call him a silent mentor, but it would be the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But there are so many honorable mentions like the honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and his great teaching, great influence on me. W.E.B. Du Bois, a great influence on me and my development. The great brother Booker T. Washington and what he brought to the table, a great influence on me and my development. I feel like these are great men who are not necessarily dead. I feel as if though their physical bodies may not be present, but the spirit of what they brought to the struggle, I feel like it still lives in brothers like myself. So if we're blessed to accomplish anything in the way of the liberation of our people, I know it is because we are standing on the shoulders of great ones who laid it all on the line for us to be at this level of the struggle. So what I would like to do in my short time here on earth is to be worthy. Just as I'm standing on their shoulders, I want to be, to be worthy of the next generation to be able to stand on my shoulders. And then somebody's got to stand on their shoulders because we're all just links in the chain. And I think when we think about it that way, we get away from this idea of a generational divide. We have to look at history for what it is. There are two reasons to study history. Number one, to study the successes of the past so that we'll know what to take and run with. But at the same time, we have to also study the mistakes of the past so that we don't make them twice. And if we study his history properly and learn what we're supposed to learn, then history will be best qualified to reward our research and the future will be bright. But we don't have much of a future if we're not studying our history. And we definitely don't have much of a future if we're not engaged and involved in creating history today. The people of Houston are people with giving hearts. We're a people that when a tragedy strikes, we respond probably like no other city in the world. 
when Hurricane Harvey hit, we responded. And anytime there's a major tragedy, the city of Houston shows up. The problem sometimes is getting our people to understand that there's a crisis going on every single day. You don't have to wait for Hurricane Harvey to come through. Just look at the educational system. Look at the wealth gap. Yes, it's the most diverse city in the country, but unfortunately, it's also the most segregated city. And what good is diversity if diversity does not lead to actual equality? So the thing that I can say about the people in the city of Houston is when there's a crisis, we show up. We just have to do a better job at organizing around the everyday crisis that impact and affect the daily lives of our children in this city. Now, when it comes to actually the actual logistics of organizing, the city of Houston is so big, it's almost like three or four cities put into one. So if you have a rally on the east side, you know, enough people from the east side could show up to make it look like the entire city showed up. So it's kind of complex, you know, in order to, you know, to organize in. It's a complex city because it's so big, but we make it work. But I love the city of Houston. It is where I was born. It is probably where I'll, I'll spend my final days and there's no other city like it. My name is Derek Muhammad, community activist, and this is Black History Redefined.